welcome to Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This conversation is a series called Art Insight and Community Building, presented by the Gloucester Cultural Initiative and co-sponsored by the Sawyer Free Library. Many thanks to Beth Pocock at the library for supporting the artists on the panel today and the Gloucester Cultural Initiative for the opportunity to go live online. Gloucester Cultural Initiative's mission is to enhance the cultural vitality of Gloucester, which is a coastal city situated in an area of outstanding natural beauty in Massachusetts that more than 30,000 people call home. By serving the city, the people that live and work here, artists of all disciplines, cultural organizations and creative businesses, the Gloucester Cultural Initiative aims to foster connections, collaborations and ideas. This series was developed by Valerie Nelson as a way to bring arts, insight and community building together to inform, inspire and awaken the community on topics including climate change, housing and community just and food justice. I am Mary Jenkins and I'm very happy to be moderating this session today. I'm here with Les Bartlett and Susan Quaitman. Les Bartlett is a renowned photographer of quarry landscapes and he brings his love of Capan history to art and climate change. Susan Quaitman is an Anglo-American environmental planner and silk painter who lives and works on Cape Ann in Anasquam. Her passion for landscape preservation propelled her work to, her to work on art and climate change. Susan and, Le and Les have produced public art exhibits in Massachusetts and New Hampshire using silk paintings, photography, and easy to understand scientific text on the climate crisis. So here we are in the middle of a pandemic and you may have wondered why this session is being offered now. Everyone decided to go ahead because they think the pandemic and climate change are crises that have similarities. Like COVID-19, climate change is a worldwide issue and is impacting our lives that may be subtle for some, but devastating for others. And we're being, we are being told that changing our thinking and behavior is urgent. So why are artists involved in climate change? Over millennia, artists have responded again and again to historical and social events and circumstances. Artists today have become a mainstream voice with the power to lead discussion and play a universal role in climate conversations. If you like, they are the canaries in the coal mine. Artwork can often say what words cannot and pack an emotional punch for an audience that can lead to deeper interest. Well-regarded art critic Ben Davis believes that in a world where information fatigue has created an atmosphere where crucial information is constantly disregarded or distorted, artists are creating compelling and vivid projects that translate complex scientific findings to convey information. If you like, it's a way of setting people on a journey from knowing to caring which is the path to action and stewardship. Another strength of involving artists is that they are not constrained by standard scientific um, methods. They challenge things that tend to be taken for granted. This can lead to new ways of understanding and acting upon climate change. So if art can provide a means to visualize, express, and shape the kind of society we want to create, how effective is the art at getting the message across? And what is the role of art in communicating climate change? What we're exploring today is what's happening at the intersection of art and climate change. Hello everyone. So here we are, Les, on the snowiest March day in 2015, when it snowed one foot every Wednesday in New England. We've trekked into Flat Ledge Quarry in Rockport where the water dripping down the quarry walls has turned to huge, enormous icicles. And where we decided to make a pop-up exhibit of my quarry silk paintings. And Rich, my husband, had to wear a hard hat because it was so dangerous with the icicles falling down. So these silk paintings of the quarry were a prelude to creating silk paintings about climate change. After a 15-year career as an environmental planner and then landscape designer, 
during the economic downturn of 2010. I decided to combine my passion for preserving beautiful landscapes as open space to painting landscapes on silk. And I present them as wearable pieces and more importantly, I wanted to show the silks in the landscape. So one day, about seven years ago, I realized I didn't want to throw away all my training and planning and all my connections with environmental nonprofit organizations. And the climate crisis was gnawing at me. On a brilliantly sunny morning, I had an aha moment. I realized it was my life's work to combine silk painting with climate crisis issues. I wanted to wake people up to what was happening in their backyards. As we watched high tides washing over roads, and we suffered from increasing rains and droughts. I wanted to use the emotional power of images on silk. As a community planner and activist, I asked how could art help provide a voice to change our direction? My focus became now to paint on silk coastal landscapes of the North Shore and Cape Ann and show how they were being affected by climate change. And Les, I've long admired your photography work and I'm so appreciative of your engagement and your passion about this topic. And I learned in turning my lens toward climate change that I needed to park my car in a different spot. We often start with climate issues at a very local level. And it's easy to park the car looking at the beautiful landscapes and the coast and sunsets. But this is definitely not a pretty image. Many of you will recognize Gloucester's bomb cycle of January 2018, which covered cars in the high school parking lot with six inches or more of frozen ice and snow. Here on coastal Cape Ann and the North Shore, we face soaring storm surges and flooding every time there's a nor'easter. Increasing level rise compounded by storms are ever-present shadows of our daily lives in Cape Ann. We call this image the tools of our trade. It shows a camera, paintbrushes, and dies in the window of an abandoned house at Steel Derrick Quarry in Rockport. We use these tools as our painterly lenses to view and interpret the world. And our artistic collaboration has been in place for seven years. That's actually 14 years in total. And we bring totally different backgrounds, sensibilities and skills to the table. And somehow we're able to produce work on climate change that hits your heart. I come from London, the UK via a small market town in Shropshire called Shrewsbury, which sits on the border with Wales. I was raised in London during the swinging sixties and then into the more austere Thatcherite 70s. And this number 11 bus was actually the bus that I took to school from World's End in Chelsea to Hammersmith. I was an environmentalist from the age of 18 and worked with Friends of the Earth and as a planning and community organizer for the Town and Country Planning Association in London. I came to the US in 1980 for a master's in city and regional planning at Cornell University. It certainly wasn't in the plan, but I ended up staying here. So my professional passion for landscapes began when I was hired to be director of the Mass Highways Department's open space program in the late 80s. I had a $10 million budget to acquire for conservation important scenic views from the highways. And this is the leaflet that we produced for the program. One of our biggest projects was with Ed Becker of the Greenbelt Association, where we protected the green corridor of Route 128 from Beverly to Gloucester. I became a silk painter in 2010, feeling horrible reverberations from our huge economic downturn just before. I started working with Kate Seidman, who started 10 pound studio at One Center Street in Gloucester. We've now been going for 10 years and have a strong group of wonderful silk artists. And since moving to Anisquam in Gloucester in 2018, I now have my own home studio, which you can see on the right, Goose Cove Studio, where I paint on silk and I'm learning oil painting. 
On the left is a silk scarf inspired by walking along Cape Ann's wooded trails. I grew up many buses away from the background that Susan grew up in. I come from rural Epsom, New Hampshire. And you're looking at a hundred year old farmhouse where for 300 years, my parents and grandparents and great grandparents, the farm going. And every day as a child, I was with my father to milk the one cow over the dirt roads, past the elm trees, past the lawn swing, past the outbuildings. And even as a child, I knew that there was a tremendous effort that my dad and his brothers were doing to keep one cow alive as if it was a herd of cows. The fields were mowed, the hay was gathered, the water turned on and off in spring and fall. And beneath my feet, I felt the 300 year old farm evaporating. Eventually the elms died, the dirt was paved over. And even now, seven years later, I carry within me the sense of harm and the sleaze rhythm of its dignity and death. My adult career encompassed being a jester and juggler and performer for over 30 years at the Grand David Magic Company in Beverly, Massachusetts. In that time, I also juggled a career in publishing and graphic design. But it's at the stage of the Cabot Cinema that I learned the value of light as a sensed purpose cast from within a staged space. That light within a staged space followed me into my career as a photographer photographing the large scale granite quarries of Cape Ann. And in October 2007, Chapters on a Quarry Wall opened in the Cape Ann Museum's third floor gallery. The four month installation attracted over 2,500 visitors and I experienced enormous success. And this paved my way for more painterly photography, rock faces and boulders of Cape Ann and Vermont. Here at the Cape Ann Museum one day in 2007, Susan Quaitman walked in, walked around the works, signed the guest book and left. Another seven years would pass before we formally met. So when we finally met Les, I repeatedly asked you to photograph my work. And I repeatedly said, go away, I can't be bothered. And I said, but please, would you photograph my work, my silk work? And I repeatedly said, please go away. And over time, I realized that in that please go away, I was so full of myself, so flush with success, that I couldn't see anyone else's request. So you decided finally to work with me? I did, I think. Yeah, and I think one of the things that changed, Susan, was realizing that you were really dedicated in your wish to become an artist. And so painting that I knew nothing about was your passion. And finally, finally, after maybe 400 times of your asking me, <laughs> I said, let's take a walk in the quarry. And finally, you did walk me into the quarries. And what we learned is that we like to walk slow. We walked slowly. We weren't on the phone. We weren't walking. We walk, we walk maybe a tenth of a mile, maybe a quarter of a mile. And that turned into a great result. Yes, I took your photos into the studio and took and produced silk paintings of quarries. And in the course of this, once we traveled around through Cape Ann and Rockport a lot, we made a day trip to Barrie, Vermont to visit the quarries of Barrie. And it was in Barry that Susan took this photograph of me, and we each found a quote that was really emblematic of our approach to the art. And I found a quote by John Ruskin. John Ruskin says, the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. And Leslie took this photograph of me in the quarries of Barry Vermont. And I was very moved by the quote of Isamu Noguchi, we are a landscape of all we have seen.
So we started off on this on the journey of art and science of climate change by working closely with staff at Mass Audubon and Essex County Greenbelt Association from 2013. We produced montages of silk paintings and photography of inundated iconic images, such as the Gloucester Fisherman's st statue, which is shown on the left. On the right is Sir Arthur Fiedler, the beloved conductor of the BSO. There's a statue positioned in the Charles River that Susan created this from. When we were going through the text and I added the word beloved for Arthur Fiedler yesterday, Susan told me the anecdote. This was put on, um, where was it? Where was it was this? at Bedrock Gardens in Lee, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. So someone walked up and said, well, Arthur Fiedler wasn't beloved. He was a really tough, cantankerous kind of guy. And it, made, it gave me pause because I realized that with this issue of public art, um, this isn't art in a gallery. It's, it's art that's out there for people to take a look at and walk by. And even with this, this lady who said, well, Arthur Fiedler wasn't such a great person, she was interacting with the art. And that's an important aspect of what we're doing, is that it's art that's put out for an interaction with people in a specific location. So talking about art in the location, this is our exhibit on climate change in the Great Marsh, which was shown here in the Great Marsh at Essex County Greenbelt Association's Cox Reservation in Essex, Massachusetts. You know, I, I want to add, Susan, I'm realizing that, that it's important to bring out that with these pieces and with these projects, many times the pieces move from location to another. And that just as we're sharing our reflections and remembrances and stories, the pieces move and tell their own story. Yes, indeed, Les. The, the, the pieces were moved to the Crane Estate Art Show in Ipswich. Um, and the silk paintings were combined with photography to tell the stories. And that, that you can't can hardly see it, but there's text as well, which was very kindly written by Robert Bax, Buxbaum at Mass Audubon. And again, we have a background of marsh and coastline at, from Ipswich. So, Silk paintings tell stories of climate change. These banners are hanging from Leslie's studio in Lanesville. They tell stories, stories of invasive kudzu from the south carving out the native sumac, of storm surge knocking houses from their foundations, in this case in Cape Cod, and marshes becoming mud flats as a result of sea level rise. It was in this location where Susan repeatedly said, would you please work with me, would you please photograph my work, would you please walk into the quarries, this very spot that Susan is standing in. And it's important to point out that uh, we have none of this. Every single piece of artwork that we're showing you, almost without exception, we printed ourselves, which gave us great control from beginning to end of the project. Well, let's print it, let's be honest. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, we collaborated in creating this a uh, poster for a big exhibit in 2016. Um, it was an exhibit on climate change and the National Park Service, a, which was also funded by the Park Service as part of their bicentennial celebration. It, it wasn't just that we got this project, and, and many of these projects we, we had to get wonderful foundations and grants to provide us the funds to do it. There is a point where passion takes over, but at the beginning, it's not all cut and dried. Susan didn't wake up and say A, B, C, D. She said, Les, I've got a hunch. I'm going to this meeting at Storm Surge and there's this man named Jonathan Parker talking from the National Park Service. And I got a hunch that there's a project that we can do. And I have learned to trust Susan's hunches. <laughs> this project in Salem at the Visitor Center ended up being 540 square feet of display space. And it was up from August to October 2016. We realized in 2015 that the United States lagged far behind other European countries in artistic efforts around climate change. And so we took the phrase, climate change does not respect boundaries, which is at the bottom left of the graphic you're looking at. And we translated it into French, Spanish, and Polish and printed it and included it in the exhibit because there are many Hispanics, Haitian, and a large community in the history of Poles in Salem. We thought this was an important step. 
project had three components. The first panel on the left covered climate change in the Salem Maritime and National Historic Site. And with it, we put a stamp of collaboration on address the local issues, respect the current efforts and questions on climate change, and address it in a larger capacity. In this case, not only is climate change does not respect bonds, we're pointing out that it's man-made and according to the IPCC, we have a very short window of 10 years to lower our emissions and find new ways of existing on this planet. That was five years ago, so put one half with five fingers on it, right? And with this panel, we introduced the science of sea level rise, which was affecting Salem shoreline, and the science of increasing precipitation, droughts, fires, and the differences between climate and weather. It's a mouthful, it's a lot. The space you're looking at was uh, about 12 feet across by 10 feet high. The middle panel, we addressed climate change in the National Park Service, where we addressed the national global issues around climate change and how they affected the national parks from Joshua Tree, Yellowstone, and to the Statue of Liberty. And here you're seeing a wonderful combination of photography and Susan's paintings collage to acquaint the severity and continue to present the science. With the third panel, we address the question of hope for the future. And certainly in the time of COVID-19, it's easy to say we're all in the same boat. We've chosen to cast a different boat on the water, a boat for children and for grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And with a boat to raise the question, what is going to be left after our talk today, after this day, after this community effort? Well, the boat was actually in the Salem Park and we managed to move it in front of the uh, panel. And as children came in, children gathered in the boat. Well, you're right, Les. I like, like playing hunches. Um, <laughs> and one of the hunches was after I went to a lecture um, by the Nature Conservancy on landscapes resilient to climate change. And I had a hunch that this was actually something that's, that was pertinent to the quarry landscapes. The lecture was conducted by Dr. Mark Anderson of the Nature Conservancy. And he said that a climate resilient landscape is one where the effects of climate change are actually buffered by natural properties of the landscape. The diverse topography, the diversity of species, the different microclimates and connected natural pathways allowing safe passage for animals. After all my walks through the quarries with Les, I asked the Nature Conservancy if Rockport and Gloucester's quarry landscapes were actually climate resilient landscapes. And they looked at the science and they looked at their maps and they said, they said yes. So Les and I decided to apply for grants to create a specific exhibit on this topic. And we got grants from Applied Materials, Essex County Ecology Center and the Greenbelt Association to create an outdoor exhibit of silk paintings and photography on climate change resilience. This was an exhibit for the Quarry Dance 5 at the Clemola Reservation. And it, Quarry Dance 5 was organized by Windhover Center for Performing Arts. Here we see a poster that we made in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. So along the way, Susan's hunches started to become a matter of fact, conversations back and forth, text and emails. And I realized that I was waking up every day thinking about how we were going to get to the next part of the project, even more so than where I was going to go to photograph a walk. So you see the title of the poster, The Resilient Quarry Landscape of Cape Ann. Something takes place at this moment with this man that really sinks into my muscles of the importance of art and climate change. So the poster is clear. It's graphically presented. We had the charts and graphs drawn up by the Nature Conservancy. This man lives down the road from where he is now. He's looking at a the poster and he's saying, I live here. It's my neighborhood, but I don't know where I am at. So I realized that there was a gap between science and art 
and understanding that part of the gap that we needed to cover was to provide a way, a simple way for the viewer to come in and to stand or to sit and understand what we were presenting. And so much of it was done at the Clamola and Resilient Landscape Project reflected this. This is one of Susan's extraordinary soap paintings of the Clamola quarry, where you can see the quarry to the left, the beautifully muted trees and shadows and her silk hanging from the copper rods that allowed it to move through the air. And it exemplifies that we often create landscape artworks exhibited in position and being able to move to different locations. On the left is that Clamola painting in a window at the Marblehead Art Association because the concept of the resilient landscape traveled from Rockport and Cape Ann to the Marblehead Art Association, where we examined resilience in both Cape Ann and Marblehead. In Marblehead, we focused on community resilience. And we suggested that Marblehead as a town was much more resilient, able to recover from adverse situations as a result of their many open spaces. We imagine that this is even more the case now with COVID-19. And here we are in Wyman Woods in Marblehead, which we walked through and Les took photographs. His photograph that we showed at the exhibit is shown on the upper left. And I brought this photo into 10 pound studio and created the silk painting on the lower left. We made a montage of the two, which you see on the right. This montage represented a breakthrough of, it wasn't just two artists bringing their own views, it was that the views merged into something entirely new. Susan was away, I think you were away at your daughter's graduation, right, at college? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I call her to say, Susan, people are walking into the gallery and they're walking up to the Wyman Woods collage and they're saying, wow, I don't know what this is, something new, it's something different. Um, it just hits me. And I think that's become something that we've, uh, sharpened our pencils and paintbrushes and camera lenses on to produce even more frequently. All of this comes a result of the walking. So this is my chance to tell the anecdote of the Ganesic Rock, which is on the left. Uh, one of my first solitary walks to Marblehead for the project was to go to Steer Swamp. And there down a series of switchbacks through branches, I spied a rock that was about 10 feet off the path, the Ganesic Rock. 10 feet off the path, but no one paid it any attention because the people walking there were walking with smartphones, walking with babies in packs, walking with dogs, walking with cell phones and dogs pushing baby carriages and not looking at what was to be seen right in front of them or near to them. We walked through every preserved open space we could find in Marblehead. And we realized that the very existence of these small pockets of open spaces is one of the reasons for densely built Marblehead's resilience as a community. And to the right of the rock itself, you see one of Susan's wonderful silk painting interpretations and visions of the rock. Walking slowly. Well, now we're moving on to our current project, the Once and Future Salt Marsh. Our clients are the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge and Woods Hole Ecosystem Center. The image within our logo is my first silk painting of a salt marsh sparrow, the canary in the marsh. It takes 26 days for a salt marsh sparrow to lay her eggs, incubate, hatch, and fledge her chicks. Her nest is on the very edge of the marsh. She typically lays her eggs immediately after a string spring tide has passed. The eggs and chicks then have only one more spring tide to survive before they're ready to leave the nest. Her nest can float up on the high tide and settle down when the tide drops, which allows the eggs to bob up and down. But if there's a very high tide, the young chips, chicks can't escape. And there are increasingly high tides because of sea level rise and the chicks face a terrifying danger of drowning if flooding happens too often. Salt marsh sparrows face extinction in 50 years time. Meanwhile, the photographer who went along when we went out into the salt marsh to see the salt marsh nest, I had my camera and I said, I would really like to photograph this little bird flying. 
and I saw yet another gap between science and art. I can sum up what a salt marsh sparrow looks like to you. If you can envision a baked potato flying through the air with wings, that's the way this little bird would fly about 10 feet and settle down. I have no idea how the iron bird can migrate, but it's a baked potato, or maybe not a baked potato, a live potato. <laughs> We're working closely with scientists and staff from these two agencies. Um, on the left is Anne Giblin from the Marine Biological Lab Laboratory at Woods Hole. And the, on the right is Nancy Powell, a biologist at the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. One of the things that we love to do in these projects is to collaborate very closely with scientists. And both Anne and Nancy have provided us with invaluable scientific understanding of the effects of climate change on the Great Marsh and how scientists are working to create a much more resilient and sustainable marsh. And I also want to give a shout out to Robert Buxbaum, recently retired from Mass Audubon. Hi, Robert. <laughs> He really helped us a great deal in getting started with this project. So part of the project is looking at fiddler crabs and what's happening with the fiddler crabs as a result of climate change. And this is a silk painting in the making of fiddler crabs in the marsh. They're actually typically found much farther south in Georgia but they're moving north to Cape Ann and up to the Plum Island Marsh because the larvae I live in are warming waters. The waters are warming because of climate change. The male fiddler crabs have a distinctive, very large left claw, which they use to attract females. And they also use it to create two foot long burrows. The scientists call them ecosystem engineers. If a multitude of these crabs arrive in our marshes digging many, many burrows, they could potentially contribute to destabilizing the marsh, or they could simply help aerate the marsh, allowing marsh grasses to thrive and provide more habitat for important shore birds like egrets. One of our charters for this project on the Western Future Salt Marsh is to incorporate uh, contemporary photography, historic photography, and historic art. The Great Marsh, the Natural and Cultural Resources timeline is slated to be on a wall eight feet wide by seven high. At the bottom of it is a photograph of the Great Marsh. And I would just like to say that that was taken with the iPhone 11. It's panoramic. At print size, it's going to be 40 inches high by eight feet in width, and it's a fall scene. Above it, what might be seen as being perhaps clouds or hard to know what it might be mountains is a historic painting by Arthur Wesley Dow, who was uh, a luminary figure in American art, a native of Ipswich. And he resolved his views of the marsh, grass, water, and sky into a singular view. Uh, one of the reasons we talked about and selected this particular image is that Arthur Wesley Dow spent 10 years looking at this scene before he decided or found a way to present his view. And so we selected this painting to suggest that history is always present and always guiding the present. Well, wait a minute, Les. Talking about the present, we also wanted to say that because of COVID-19, we might well be doing, just doing an outdoor exhibit, not an indoor oh, exhibit. This is true. Yep. That's one of the great challenges. I'll go back to the slide just a minute. One of the great challenges with, with public art, all the big projects we've done, we've had them scaled, done, ready to print, and all of a sudden the dimensions of the space change. And so it's a really interesting challenge for the Once and Future Salt Marshes. We've designed it for indoors, got all the panels sized, and now it looks like it's going to be outdoors. So it's a, a great opportunity to go back to the drawing board. So I will talk to the Cape Ann Climate Coalition, which I'm a member of and have been since its very inception, which is encouraging the collaboration of many local environmental activists and organizations. And we actually have seven action groups and I'm involved with a climate arts group, which we will be holding online or a live climate festival on November 28th. 
So we want to encourage local Cape Ann artists to change their artistic lens and look at climate change as it affects them, whether it's from sea level rise to carbon sequestration or to the connections with COVID-19. And young people and children are especially invited to join us in creating a Cape Ann climate arts movement. Do you have anything else you want to add to, on this one, Susan? No, I don't think so. Okay. So we're going to wrap up here by going back to the beginning and reminding you that climate change does not respect boundaries. In fact, climate change does not respect Cape Ann. Climate change does not respect words. Climate change does not respect where you expect things to remain. When you sign out of Zoom, you think that the key will fit the door to your house, that the key will fit the door to your car. We think that our families are going to remain. We expect our cherished icons to always remain the same. We face the unsettling of cherished icons due to new impending storms.